Chow, and today we are having a webinar uh, in honor of Black History Month, uh, the challenges and opportunities for cooperative development in African American communities. And we are in for a treat today. We have with us Melba Smith. She is a 2009 inductee into the Cooperative Hall of Fame. The Cooperative Hall of Fame is the highest honor given in the co-op community to someone whose life work in supporting cooperatives is truly heroic. Melba spent 40 years developing co-ops in African American communities across rural Mississippi, Alabama, and the Deep South. Not only are cooperatives a means to build mutually owned businesses, it is also a wonderful tool for building leadership capacity in unserved and underserved communities. As you will hear during this webinar, Melba would go into those underserved communities to help identify leaders. Then she would encourage those leaders to use the co-op model to accomplish their dreams. Melba McCaffey Smith was born in rural Rankin County, Mississippi. Her family farmed 40 acres of fruit, vegetables, and livestock. Melba attended a one-room schoolhouse where her mother was the only teacher. Melba earned a degree in business administration from Mississippi Valley State University and a graduate degree from Tuskegee University. In 1972, at the ripe age of 26, Melba moved to Epps, Alabama to serve as the Director of Consumer Cooperatives at the Rural Training and Research Center with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Then from 1972 to 74, Melba served as the Director of the Black Belt Community Health Center, an effort by the Federation to provide healthcare services to residents of North Sumter County. During the 1970s, she served in a variety of capacities for the Federation, including Comptroller of the Rural Training and Research Center in Epps. Working with the Federation afforded Melba her first opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. to meet with congressional delegates to discuss challenges facing rural residents. She brought those experiences back to rural Alabama and then eventually Mississippi, helping people to organize and to realize that they could affect change. Melba worked to identify leaders in rural communities and encourage those leaders to join together using the cooperative model in their towns. In 1978, Melba returned to her home state, serving as the director of the Mississippi Association of Cooperatives within the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Funding was at times tenuous. Sometimes she served in this capacity in conjunction with Elkhorn State University Cooperative Extension, and then there was a period of 15 months in which she worked as a volunteer without payment to continue on the work. Melba's work was never nine to five. She worked until the job was done. She attended endless hours of meetings, riding tractors with farmers, eating meals at night meetings, and working weekends. Colleagues often describe Melba as having intuitiveness when coming into contact with groups. Once she would make an assessment of a group, she would work hard to, with those groups to birth brand new businesses. In 1997, Melba added a new responsibility to her work. She became the Executive Director of the Mississippi Center for Cooperative Development, which, was par which is partially funded by the USDA Rural Cooperative Development Grant. Ever a cooperative developer and enthusiast, she helped organize over 25 cooperatives across Mississippi, the Virgin Islands, and in post-Katrina efforts with the Gulf Coast communities. Projects range from producer marketing co-ops, farmers markets, a cotton gin serving minority cotton producers, and affordable family housing. On a national level, Melba organ helped to organize Cooperation Works which is a network of co-op development centers and practitioners. As you will hear from the uh, conversation today, Melba is a strong woman of faith and vision. She challenges others to dream and to fulfill those dreams. Her consistent advocacy on behalf of the underserved, low-income farm families and rural residents has made Melba a recognized agent for change in the cooperative world. Since the beginning of her career, her message has remained consistent. 
As Melba observes, we must help to preserve rural communities, and there is no better way than the use of the cooperative model. For her tireless work with some of the poorest communities of the Deep South, Melba was inducted into the Cooperative Hall of Fame in 2009. In 2009, Melba retired from her formal duties with the Mississippi Center for Cooperative Development and the Mississippi Association of Cooperatives. Post-retirement, Melba served as interim director of the newly organized Coalition for a Prosperous Mississippi. She also served as a mentor to Jackson Rising, a citywide effort to create community economic development for underserved African Americans by utilizing the cooperative model. We are thrilled for Melba to share reflections on the challenges and opportunities for co-op development in African American communities. She will share insights on organizing co-ops in some of the poorest rural areas of the country. Always the visionary, Melba will also speak about what she sees as future possibilities for cooperative development. With that, thank you for this opportunity, and we're excited to hear your presentation, Melba. Thank you so much, Margaret. And I say good afternoon to everyone and take this opportunity to thank um, Margaret and USDA for their invitation to share a few of my experiences in working with cooperatives in rural areas and primarily in African American communities and in the South. So thank you all and thank you all for this kind invitation. So as I begin, I'd like to share a bit about my growing up in rural Mississippi. And this is possibly a reason why I could relate to other rural communities uh, similar to that of my own. I grew up in a town called Brandon, Mississippi. And during this time, I experienced a lot of inequities as a child. I grew up in a family of my mother and father and my brother. And my father, I think I get most of who I am from my father because he was a kind man and he was a man who did quite a bit of work for other people. And they would ask him to do something, he would never say no. He was always there. And I thank, thank them for that, uh, the things that they shared with me, and I guess getting to where I am today because of my background and the roots that I had with my father and my grandfather. My grandfather was a farmer as well. And he grew all the food that we ate, and uh, we learned how to work, and we, we didn't shy away from hard work, and we didn't shy away from farming. <clears throat> there was a lot of cooperation among families living in the community, and most people who lived in the South, and I guess in other rural communities throughout the country, we would always share with one another if there was a need. And I found that to be the same way when I began to work with cooperatives. I did not participate in the civil rights movement early on, one reason being that my mother was taught in the public school system and was threat with the loss, threatened with the loss of her job if she were found to be uh, either she or members of family participating in the civil rights movement. I'd just like to share a little bit about my background and the inequities that I saw. Uh, I attended a one-room, one, one school uh, with one teacher <laughs> from the first through the eighth grade. And by the way, my mother was my first teacher, but I then attended another one-room, one school, schoolhouse. And in there I saw uh, how African-American schools received materials from other schools and we could see that as children where these were used best with other kids' name on them that we didn't recognize. And then we could also see the books where they had been used maybe two or three years and, and you had to write your name in your book. And, and that always stood out to me um, why we were receiving used things from other students. Some of our students sat on benches and that was made by community residents. And I think that was, um, was something that also stood out to me about how community people worked together to provide an education for children that lived in our community. Um, but the love that existed in these situations uh, by them working together 
And also as I grew, we were the last ones in our community to receive electricity, the last ones to receive telephones, uh, and the last one to receive a community water system. And there were roads that were unpaid, and my dad had to travel to his job at night. And because the roads, when the rains came in, were muddy and he couldn't drive, he had to park his truck about three to five miles away from my house and walk through the woods at night when it was raining and cold in order to get to his truck, in order to get to his work, which was in Jackson, Mississippi. And that's the thing that stood out to me. You know, why did my dad have to go through this when he was trying to um, earn income to support his family? So these things grew and more and more in my heart about how to bring change um, and I could hear my mother and my father talking about uh, not getting involved in the civil rights movement, but they would all they would not shy away from um, our being engaged and growing up and becoming all we could be. My mother would say, "Hey, a high school, a college education." will be just like a high school degree, so you're going to have to go further. You're going to have to get a master's degree. You know, I can't stop there. Even though I've got a BS degree, you need to go further. And, and we learned that, and we took it to heart, and we worked in that way. But after graduation, I worked, my first job was to work in a Head Start program. And here I met families live, who lived in poverty, mothers who were keeping uh, care of their children at home and and did not have a lot of food to provide for their children. And most of the children that came to the Head Start program were only able to get one meal a day, and that was the meal and the snack that we provided uh, at the Head Start program. And then I became more and more aware of other things that were going on around me, and I'm sure that... Uh, changed my thought pattern and began to grow up in me as how could I change this? How, why are rural areas um, not receiving the same services as those in the inner city? So that, that stood out in me. And after leaving the Head Start program, uh, I began a career with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which was organized in 1967 by 22 cooperatives around the South. Now, the Federation was an outgrowth of the civil rights movement, and it was formed by these 22 cooperatives in the Southeast to support them. They needed a, an organization that could provide the technical assistance that would help strengthen them to move forward with their vision of forming a co-op and their goals that they had in doing just that. And primarily most of these were agricultural cooperatives during that time. So let's talk a little bit about the civil rights movement and what I remember about that. It gave courage to many black farmers to join cooperatives. Why is that? Because these farmers, had to band together. They saw themselves as banding together in order to um, increase their income and to support their families and to make money from their crops. Uh, provoke more discrimination, I think, the civil rights movement did by white owners, business owners against black farmers. And having come out of the civil rights movement, these people had experienced a lot of inequities and they knew that in order to move forward, they had to work together. And so I think it gave them that courage to saw the changes that were brought about by the Civil Rights Movement to begin working together. And discrimination in some cases, the discrimination, and I'll talk about that with this Milestone Cooperative Association located in Chula, Mississippi. This type of discrimination induced cooperative formation. It brought about hey, let's band together. They've heard about cooperatives, and they thought this was a means to move forward and to uh, continue to earn a living and provide for their families. 
So Mountain Cooperative was organized in 1944 in a small town in Chula, Mississippi, in the Delta of Mississippi. And it was a cotton gin that was organized by 50 African-American farmers. Now, what was the situation? What brought them to this? What was the problem there that they were experiencing? They would bring their cotton in trailers to the gin, which was white on, but their trailers would sit there for weeks on weeks and not be gin, and they only had a few trailers that they needed, which was used to go back into their cotton fields and, and pick further cotton and bring it back. But since their trailers were not, the cotton in their trailers were not gin, then they lost money. They weren't able to retrieve their cotton that remained in the field. And then later in November, the rain would set in and then, therefore their cotton would be lost. So there was a problem and there was a situation that brought them to the point that we need our own cotton gin. And that's what brought them together. And Mouson was a very successful cooperative. Not only a successful cooperative, but it was a leadership in that rural community, which is called Mouson, where other people could see men coming together and women coming together and owning their own business. Now, as part of the Civil Rights Movement, too, some families in Alabama lived on plantations. Because they chose to go and register to vote, they were kicked off the plantation. And so this began a housing association, which was established uh, to um, to to uh, remedy that situation. And I and I, I was a part of that, having worked with the federation, came with them in 1972, as Margaret mentioned, dating me way back to that, but. The work that I had done in the Head Start movement, the work, the, the things that grew up in me, the discrimina discrimination in my communities and being the last to receive basic services, sort of prepared me for the next step, and that was with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. So what did we learn in my work? What, what, what were some of the lessons that we learned? Cooperative members had very limited understanding of cooperative enterprise and their principles. But when they were introduced to it, they embraced it because of the things that I just talked about, the inequities that existed, and they knew they needed another way out. They couldn't continue the way that they were going, the track that they were on. Uh, so the Federation of Southern Cooperatives provided that technical support for most of these cooperatives in the South. Now, I, see, I have a word there that says, went fast to go slow, and, but I also said organization of cooperatives takes some time. Most of them heard about it and incorporated with the state of Mississippi and got their business off the ground, but were not prepared for the next step. They knew their vision. They knew the outcome that they wanted. But how did they, how to get there was, an, uh, uh, was something that they had not experienced before. Business planning, marketing, uh, uh, marketing strategies. Uh, how, where were they going to sell their cotton to? Uh, what, uh, what other things? How were they going to get their product into the market? Looking at all of that. Um, sound record keeping. These are the things that we were doing as staff members of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. We also found that the management and cooperative education was deficient. As I just mentioned, they knew where they wanted to go, but how did they get there? And this was where we were able to provide some services. They liked that sound infrastructure that I just mentioned that was needed to strengthen them and get them on the right road and to be successful. Now, sometimes in my work, I found that a lot of people, not, not everybody, but some people would say co-ops don't work. But my point here is cooperatives work if you work them, if you work how they are supposed to be set up and how you move forward in putting this infrastructure in. It works. And if people are willing to work together, 
I'll talk about that a little later on. Marketing access was a problem and sustaining involvement of membership. And I talked about at the bottom there, constant expansion and developing a strong educational program. Um, understanding what cooperatives are and how they work and then sharing that and learning that and then learning how to work together and putting all these things in place. So going forward, talk about that a little bit. Constant education, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, even though we had principles, cooperative principles that we taught in our training program, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives would have um, training sessions at their uh, training center in Epps, Alabama, and we'd bring farmers in, we'd bring others in, uh, consumer cooperative staff and other people there and, and to train, and then we'd send people out, uh, staff people. And we had the local associations, uh, state associations in these states that had staff that was working directly with the co-op members in those particular states. So we found that constant education was something that we needed to continue, not just train in what co-ops are about, how to structure cooperatives, management, that time board, board of directors training, all of those. But we found that even when new members come in, there was still a need to educate them too so they would all be walking in the same direction. Constant education was one of our principles that the Federation used. Continual tech, technical assistance for both new and emerging groups. Uh, just last week, uh, a local cooperative that I'm a member of here uh, in Rankin County, Mississippi, we were looking at a farm and feed supply store there. We have about 27 farmers, and, and uh, they're mostly livestock farmers, but some vegetables and some herb growers and a few others too. But we found out that we, we have a plan, and we know where we want to go, but we need technical assistance to help get us there. And so the Federation has provided that, but also looked outside to see if there's other sources of assistance. Um, financial startup funding uh, in low wealth communities is what's needed. Development of a marketing strategy, both state and regional. We've had these market marketing strategies going forward in um, Two states working together, Alabama and Mississippi, well, three states in Georgia working together, small farmers, growing vegetables, growing watermelons, um, growing other types of crops, where they, in order to meet the market demand, had to come together. So that's strengthening these groups. Now, cooperation among cooperatives uh, provides support for smaller groups, working together works. I'd like to say about that right there. This is a principle that the co-op principle that the Federation uses too. But looking at the much larger cooperatives, maybe not even from um, the South, if you actually believe that cooperation and cooperatives work, then cooperation not only extends just to your group, your co-op, but it extends to other groups. Much larger groups can, can reach down and help smaller groups. And this is one of the things that I'm really pushing for, the co-op that I just talked about in, in, um, here in Rankin County. We're doing a feed and farm supply store. How do we set that up? Where can we get feed at cost and be able to sell it to our members and still make money? A strategy for that. There's somebody out there with that experience that we don't have as small farmers, livestock farmers. Can another cooperative say, let's go in and help this group. Let's help build that. See, cooperation is just not in your own section of the country. It's across the state. Every time I walk into the grocery store here 
in my local community, I see Florida natural orange juice. Now, I don't buy the other orange juice. Why is that? Because I, I am convinced that cooperation works. And if we work together, we can change things not only in our local community, but in our region as well as in this country. There's a spiritual relationship to working together. So the next point I'd like to, and I'll, I'll talk a little further on this, encourage the formation and development of all types of uh, cooperatives in all sectors. We're having a, a, a situation here in um, in Mississippi where uh, in Mississippi you can only incorporate up on the laws, co-op laws in the state of Mississippi allows you to incorporate agricultural and marketing cooperatives only. But there are a lot of needs in these states. There are a lot of needs in rural communities that could be best met by using the cooperative model, whether it be housing, whether it be health care, um, whether it be worker on, and just an example of that, of a worker on in Hines County, Mississippi, is the county where Jackson is located, the capital for the state of Mississippi. There are a lot of, um, I met this gentleman who, of a white gentleman from his local church, and he had been working in this um, section, inner city section of the community in Jackson with a lot of um, vacant lots. And he was very, very interested in that, cleaning up those lots. But then he saw further that there was an opportunity, and he met a lot of people. He met a lot of carpenters, bricklayers, electricians, plumbers, who were out of work, of seasonal work, and didn't have a lot of work. So when we were talking about this, he said, yes, we need worker-owned cooperatives where these guys can come together, and women, not just guys, come together, pool their resources, pool their expertise, and begin um, using their craft to build the inner city, dilapidated homes that could be remodeled, some need to be torn down, to do things together. But what does that do? It gives them hope. It gives them. Um, it gives them employment, but it also gives them an opportunity to have the bonding that they need in order to bid on some of these projects and be able to earn income for themselves and for the for their families. But not only that, it builds the community and it gives hope to the community people seeing that new structures are going up, and then it disperses those that, that may be doing unlawful things in that community. It disperses them from that because these people have risen up and want to change their community. So, that, so this law that we're talking about in, in, in Mississippi on the books, it's not only in Mississippi but in the South. Most of these southern states have similar laws that ex exclude the formation of other co-ops in other sectors throughout. Uh, one example is one, one of our co-ops, which is a health food store, had to go to Wisconsin in order to become incorporated and then apply to come into Mississippi and do business. So these are the things we're talking about, two things that are most important. And most important is changing the law in the state of Mississippi, cooperation among cooperatives, um, working with, with each other to, to bring about change in the community, which can bring. But as I mentioned earlier, Cooperative to me is, is a spiritual type thing. Working with one another calls for us 
to have a vision, first of all. These are the keys that I'm talking about now, keys to success. Must have a clear vision. Must know where you're going. Calling those things that be not as though they were. What am I saying? I'm not over there where I'm going, but I will get there. A mission statement. Have a clear path as to how you will get there. Yes, I will get there. Faith must believe that the vision will come to pass. And talk again about trust, that each member has the good of the co-op in mind in every decision. I'd just like to stay on this just for a few minutes. It says in the Bible, write the vision. Make it clear so that those who read it can understand it and catch hold and go forward with it. We found in our co-ops when I talked about going fast to go slow, being incorporated. I've heard about it. Yes, this is something that I want to do. But not having all of the understanding, and the Federation has 11 steps, I believe, before you actually start putting your bylaws together and your incorporation papers and actually submitting that to the state to do business in that state. So uh, doing these things are important. They're, they're steps to, to a successful business venture. And so I call that now the vision, making it clear. I had an opportunity to visit Haiti with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And we, we were looking at cooperatives over there and, and, and doing some technical support. And I think this is really key when I talk about education. Before you could become a member of their cooperative, you had to spend three months learning about not only what cooperatives were, but what the vision of this particular that particular cooperative was. How did it get started? How did it come into existence? Where are we going? What is the vision? And what is the strategy to get there? And then people determining then, is this the place for me? Is this where I need to be? Or do I need to go out and organize my own business and work by myself? Can I work with other people? Or do I need to work by myself? There's some people in cooperatives that may or may not need to be there. And I call those like-minded people in working in the community. Like-minded, having the same vision and wanting to work with others to bring that vision to pass. And it takes some time to do that. It's not an overnight fix. It's not an overnight accomplishment, but it can, you can get there. Working together works. I believe that, that the vision will come to pass, that each member has the good of the co-op in mind, and not distracting from that or taking away from that, but keeping their mind focused on where we're trying to go, and that's the ultimate and most important decision. Where are we going? And then once you get there, then looking at the community and see are there other things that you need to be um, involved in in order to correct whatever other situation is out there. So it's plenty to do. It's doing it step by step, working together. <laughs> Working together. And my next slide says, working together is an art form. It's a symphony. I like that. It's a symphony. Everybody in tune. Nobody playing a note that you can pick up by your ear and say, hmm, they missed it. But you must start from A and go to B and then go to C. 
and move forward in order to bring that about. Like-minded people is the word I love to use, like-minded, those that are interested in this and want to go forth. Sharing skills, talents, and above all, learning to compromise is, is essential when working with a group of people. It's not my way. It's our way. And I've learned this over the years. Be a team player by cooperating with group members. Respect other opinions. How can we walk together unless we agree? I've had many experiences in throughout Mississippi and throughout Alabama, and went all over the state, primarily in Alabama and in Mississippi. All the other states pretty much that the Federation worked in and had staff in. But let me just share this. Whenever I would go to a group to do training, maybe at 7 o'clock at night, and as I would be driving there, getting there to the meeting, leaving the office maybe at 5 and driving two hours to get for a 7 o'clock meeting, and I would meditate on well, what am I going to talk about, what am I going to share tonight after having prepared during the day to go there. Once I presented, <laughs> and on my way back, I would say, my, I learned so much tonight. I learned so much tonight from the people that I was talking to. I had prepared, and yes, what I prepared was well received, but I also received what they had to give to me. I think that was a great teacher right there. I have I have, um, have have I now go back and visit these co ops and some of the people that still are living and are still there and share and talk with them because I made so many friends and talk with them. But it also spans back to my mother and my father. And it goes back to that, how they walked, how they talked, how they loved people, and how they did for people, and how they did for those who didn't have a vehicle to get to the store or to get their medicine or to get their groceries, and how they did that. And my father would do that too, because how he uh, would bring seeds and fertilize the home to those older people who were didn't know how to drive, and he would be passing by that store, and they would do what we call in the rural area sin go, sin go, and he would bring it back. But I'm saying that to say this that that became a part of me, and my work expressed that as I went forward. Not that I know everything, but I learned from those people who knew something too. And we were able to put that together and walk together and accomplish that what we were trying to do. I'd like to say, too, that I believe in cooperatives. I know they work. I have worked them. I know that sometimes they fail because of personalities, because of this or because of that. But I'm committed to that. And in my daily work, I'm still doing that kind of thing. So I came full force in my career. And organized a cooperative in this county, and it's an agricultural cooperative. And I talked about it a little bit earlier. It's a livestock cooperative, but I'm a vegetable grower and an herb grower, and so I'm part of that cooperative. <clears throat> so my life has come full circle in terms of this type of work, but not in terms of the work that I have yet to do. 
but I'm appreciative of the people that have walked along the way with me. Appreciative to my parents. Appreciative to the discrimination that I experienced. I'm appreciative for that too. One room school, the lack of basic services in our community. Appreciative of the civil rights movement. Appreciative of the Federation of Southern Co-Office when I left there to continue my walk in working in rural communities. And my, my whole concern was to go away and learn about these things and bring them back to my state. <laughs> and I walked that out. I walked that full circle coming back and now have working with the local cooperatives here. I'm appreciative of that, and I'm appreciative of the cooperative community and the things that they talked about in the introduction. I'm appreciative of that as well. But two things or three things I would like to leave with you. Co-ops do work. There's a need for the change of law in the state of Mississippi and these other states, and I want to, to express that again, to allow us or anyone to incorporate a cooperative business to meet the needs of especially rural communities, and those are the ones that I'm working with, but also inner city areas. And that's some work that we've been working on for four years, and we have not gotten this piece of legislation through the legislature. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> we're going slow to go fast, <laughs> but we're working on it. And we now have uh, some talking about, well, you don't need a co-op, you need an LLC. And that to me is because they don't understand cooperatives and the whole spirituality to co-ops and how people begin to work together and begin to share, just like the cooperative gene that I talked about earlier, where milestone cooperatives, when one farmer tractor broke down or their cotton picker broke down, these farmers would go over and help him get his cotton out of the field. You, talk to, you see what I'm talking about? This is a spiritual walk. This is love for one another. And this is what co-ops brings together, other than a business idea and a business concept, and a marketing strategy, and how to make money. But it also brings people together to build something. And when they complete that, they move to the next thing that needs to be done in order to build their community. And I'm appreciative uh, for that opportunity. Cooperation among cooperatives, I'm going to stress it again. There are groups out there that have been successful in other states and in other parts of this country that have expertise in areas that some of these co-ops need that can be very helpful. We, need, we as the cooperatives need to identify what those are, but we need to search out. And these larger co-ops need to be able to make a decision to say, we're going to help those too, reaching back in helping those. I think the cooperatives that the members of the Federation have done a great job. We've all heard about Freedom Quilt and Bee and how that cooperative uh, flourished, you know, quilting, working together. So I'm just appreciative of, of the time that I've had to uh, spend in this Movement. <laughs> That's what we call it, a movement. So we need to keep it going. And we need to continue to work. And I'm just so thankful to you at USDA giving me this time to share. And also, and I mentioned again, my parents and other people and the communities that I've been in who helped me grow and who shared their homes and I could spend the night or 
do things and learn and saw the love that existed there and the concern and uh, and some have youth programs that they're continuing to teach uh, about the cooperative principle and learning more about that so they can carry on. I'm so thankful for that. And I'm thankful for you all today and for your listening. And I hope that I've shared something that uh, was beneficial to you. And I'm thankful for those people who taught me something <laughs> as I drove back from those late night meetings coming home. But I've enjoyed every minute of it. I wouldn't change my life. And I'll show you this one last thing. Just this past week, I was driving along the road, and I do this all the time. I drive along the road and meditate. And one time I was driving along the road, meditating, and I told the Lord that out of all the years that I have worked and had traveled up and down the road, coming home late at night, 12 or 1 o'clock, not one time did my car break down. Not one time did I experience anything that was a threat to me. I'm appreciative, but also appreciative of the things that I've been, and I talk with him all the time, the Lord, and I just talked with him the other day, and he, I was all, would always ask myself, what is my purpose on this earth? <laughs> and he made it clear, you walked out your purpose, <laughs> and I was so thankful that he is. He said clearly, what you're doing, sharing, caring, and helping people was your purpose. And I set you in the right family to get that foundation. And I put you with the right people, the Head Start and the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and other groups that I work with to walk out your life plan that I had for you. Thank you so much for listening to me today, and I hope I've said something that encouraged you, and I'm so happy to be uh, with you today. And I'll turn it to Margaret. Oh, Melba, we are so appreciative and grateful to you for sharing your heartfelt stories and observations. Um, I of course everyone is muted but if if anyone had the same reaction as me I was mhm mhm and I was I was just grinning from ear to ear as as I listened uh to what you had to share Melba thank you for for doing that uh, Melba I'd like to share with you an email that came in from Claudette Fernandez of the USDA uh, a National Office, and she wrote, Ms. Smith, we thank you so very much for the opportunity to hear and learn from you. We were planning to have our Deputy Undersecretary, Bernita Dorr, to help with introductions. We are all in Portland, Oregon. But by the time we dialed in, the presentation had already started and we didn't want to interrupt. But please know that we are deeply appreciative of your continued passion for cooperative development and forthcoming interest to share your wisdom with rural development staff and beyond. It is a community economic development tool that is gaining momentum from the policy standpoint, particularly in support of those who are in distressed communities and finding ways to increase their economic opportunities and improve quality of life. Again, thank you. Respectfully, Claudette Fernandez, Acting Director, Education and Research Division, uh, Rural Business Cooperative Services, USDA. Thank you so much, Claudette. Uh -huh. Andres, would you like to uh, share some of the questions that are coming in? Sure. Uh, the first question we had, uh, there was a request, um, can you discuss the political influence, if any, of the communal movement that arose between the 1960s, early 70s uh, on the cooperative work? 
Uh, could you say that one more time? Can you discuss the potential influence, if any, the communal movement that arose between the mid-1960s, early 1970s had on your cooperative work? Oh, yeah, that, that was um, certainly an uh, opportunity. Um, because I mentioned earlier on talking about the housing and when people were kicked off their land and uh, then they had to uh, begin, um, you know, working and finding ways to provide some type of housing for their families. And so that was part of it. it um, and, and because of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives having um, located in Alabama, in a town, small town called F, Alabama, they were able to, uh, or it took a long time, but people were able to, um, you know, pool together and work together and, and, you know, live with families and that type of thing in a community. But eventually the Federation was able to help them with, with housing and uh, establish uh, housing there. So I think that that all was part of the work in, in um, getting people to uh, to a point where they were, um, they could see some movement. You know, sometimes you get bogged down in a situation and you think there's no way out. But when someone comes along and says there is a way out, then you're very appreciative of that and can and then can have hope. Sometimes there's no hope. People feel hopeless. And so that's just an encouraging word is, is something that moves people to the point where they are ready to get up and and and, and work toward uh, moving forward. So I I think that uh, you know that 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 was a great success for the Federation. All right. Uh, another question. Um, can you talk more about how, about the co-ops that have survived for decades, like um, Milston? Milston. Milston, excuse me. How do they keep members active and remembering the vision? Well, one thing, they, they had good leadership at Milston, and they had people that were committed and um, they're uh, the same way at the Freedom Quilting Bee that was Quilting Co-op, and I'm talking about those that I know about. There was a health care center in, um, in Arkansas, in Lee County, Arkansas. Some of you may remember that came out of the Civil Rights Movement, too, in OEO when there was money for health care. And um, I think, you know, keeping the vision uh, out front, you know, continuing to talk about it, not let the fire die down. It's what uh, keeps people engaged. And also constant expansion was one of the co-op principles that the, co the Federation of Southern Cooperatives used was, was looking at the membership, and I think I talked about that membership, and seeing what are the, some of the ancillary needs that they may have in addition to that. And one thing that Milson did was every year they would celebrate their accomplishments by having a big, huge fish fry. And it was not just for the co-op. It was for the entire community, and I think that is what uh, what really kept them going. They not only just did it among themselves, but they wanted other people to know. And it was a lighthouse in that community, just as the health center over in Arkansas, just as Freedom Quilt and Bee. These are just a few that I'm, I'm I'm talking about now, but that kept them going. But you must keep things relevant, and 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 not let just the uh, old soup be warmed over, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> over, but keep things new and fresh and have good leadership, strong leadership, someone that can, can, can um, co people can coalesce around, and a great manager is key to the success of any cooperative. Somebody there is on a day-to-day -day basis that can respond to the needs of the members and can also uh, have the support of the board of directors. So those are keys to me. Okay. Okay. Um, what's the biggest obstacle to enacting better cooperative law in Mississippi? Change in leadership. <laughs> the biggest obstacle is 
this, the legislature in Mississippi is all Republican, not a majority per, Republican. I can't say all Republican. And, uh, and, and there have been some misconceptions and some intentional uh, information being thrown out there that cooperatives are unions and they're going to bring unions back to the state of Mississippi. And, and we know that's not true. Every member, every, there's one person, one vote in the cooperatives. They don't need a union. They, each person represents themselves. But these are the kind of distractions and things that throw people off. Um, so we, we, we're trying now a new strategy, and that is to work with the Secretary of State. And whatever, um, I had a tip from one of the attorneys there in the, um, the that's the attorney for the Senate. And um, the uh, their, her comment was that, if the, you can convince the Secretary of State to put it as one of his bills to expand the cooperative uh, laws in the state of Mississippi, and uh, then that would, it would go through fairly easy. So we met with him and with his staff, and, asked, and they've asked us to put together a task force team representing our views, and then, of course, they'll have their business people there talking about why it should be an LLC. So we're right after our session ends, which ends at the end of March, but it will continue this year through the end of April because they have some extra business they need to to take care of. So right after then, we'll be meeting. The, the secretary will appoint this uh, task force team, and 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 uh, we're 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 looking at people from all over, not just Mississippi. People who have experience with cooperatives and that could sit on this task force, and we'll be identifying those, and hopefully we'll convince them. <laughs> but that's the obstacle. Uh, most of um, uh, the Republicans now um, control both uh, the Senate and the, and the House of Representatives and the governorship and the lieutenant governorship. We only have one Democrat, and he's the attorney general. All right. Um, how can we help? How can we help you at USDA with your efforts to enact better cooperative law? Right. <clears throat> now, in a meeting that I had, um, mm, and Jessica was on. Jess, I see Jessica Gordon Nimhard is on the um, on on this uh, webinar. But she and I and several other people were talking about that and. I think that there is some relationship with USDA, so we're going to be pulling in that relationship. And um, you know, there also is a uniform co-op law that's been out there and enacted in some states. So we're going to be looking at that as well, and looking at what are the needs in the South, particularly, uh, and can we adopt some of that, or do we need it all of the uniform co-op law, or should we? Um, Look at um, ways to that will accommodate a lot of the needs that's particularly uh, related to the South. But yes, uh, people that are, are willing to step forward and serve on a task force, we'd be glad to have you. All right. Um, one last question: uh, What's the most important ingredient to building a su successful cooperative? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, li limited. Uh, um, hmm, I just said it before. Um, um, I think it's um, working together. I think is is that and like-minded people having the same needs and having the same concern and going in the same direction. To a lot of our cooperatives, you know, I, sadly enough, is because people have all different types of ideas as to how co-op should work or how this should be done. But leadership, I think, is that, and then those like-minded people working together to bring about change. I think those are, those are and then, then um, successful co-op. I didn't mention this, I don't think, earlier, but I'd like to mention now. 
some of the co-ops in the low wealth community do need some startup funding. But I think that startup funding will be tied to a plan that shows exactly how they will uh, reach the goals that they've set. So I think that USDA could certainly, and I think they've already doing it, putting some types of funding out there. But um, startup funding would, would certainly be helpful with some groups. And of course, there are other groups that that can get money, you know, on their own, but they need that technical assistance in order to make sure they're on the right track to meet the goals that they've set and to reach that vision that they've set for themselves and to actually meet that need that they're trying to to meet. So so those are some of the things. It may not be one thing, but I think like-minded people working together is one of them. (laughs) Thanks so much. Thank you, Melba. Uh, It has been a pleasure. Uh, Just to let the audience know, this uh, presentation by Melba Smith has been recorded. Uh, If you would like a copy of the recording that you could put on your websites, uh, various organizations across the country, so more people can hear the wisdom of Melba Smith, uh, please contact me, Margaret Bow. And uh, we also have uh, Melba's PowerPoint presentation available. Um, So if you could spread the word of Melba's wisdom, it would be much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melba. Have a good day. Thank you. You all have a great day.